this. I apologize to those of you who are on the ZBB. You might have seen me years ago as um, Hanika, um, the non good at nobody could say you could be up. Um, I live in the woods of Vermont, work with Trinity College up there. Um, I have been conlining for about 37 <coughs> years now, um, which probably puts me in uh, the old person school of conlining here this morning. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I apologize ahead of time for my voice because uh, I managed to get a cold as part of this trip. Uh, it's been a wonderful gift from the state of Texas. <laughs> and, uh, um, so I'm going to sound a little grass, but I'll do my best. Um, during those 37 years, almost all of that has been working on ALOSA, uh, which is my primary language. Um, I've been in the town mining community since I found the town in about 96. I've done the CBB, the CBB, now I'm um, town mining again, the LCS list, the groups on Facebook, that sort of stuff. Um, and just as a side note, for any of you who saw my, uh, my bio picture, I and mean, yes, that is a real tiger that I was sitting next to, that's um, my daughter lives in Thailand, and there's a place you could actually go and literally hang out with tigers. And <laughs> as I love cats, I, it just seemed like the right picture to use. Um, so why this talk, Shemal Pulse Hanyatha, or Living Your Language? Um, I considered Alosa to be the language of my soul, almost since I started working on it. Um, and with one small interruption, I, I really worked on it all of that time. I've had other languages that have kind of gone, but um, Alosa has really been the one. Um, and uh, in, in spite of David's introduction there, as much as I can use it, and, and I, I keep my journal in it, I write, you see me writing notes in it, um, I personally have not felt truly fluent in it. Um, not to the extent that, you know, I, well, we'll, we'll get there. Um, and a, a very good friend of mine who was actually supposed to, we were going to essentially team present this. Um, we had an hour of presentation because Jim Hopkins was going to do half of it and I was going to do half of it. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Jim couldn't make it. And so I basically grabbed a lot of Jim's material and wove it all together in one presentation. But I, Jim is somebody that I actually look up to and say, I want to be like that. Um, for, for any of you who have actually met Jim Hopkins, uh, you'll know that he can just walk down the street and have something happen and come out with a spontaneous monologue of several paragraphs in each line, just fluently, the way you or I would in English or whatever our mother tongue is. Um, and does it with, with absolutely no sense of um, hesitation or embarrassment or anything. I mean, he can just blast out with Iglani like that. Sing the sing Iglani opera, just on the story of it. Um, <clears throat> and I look at that, and, and I have to admit, I'm, I'm feeling like, wow, I, I, I always thought that I was really good at Alorsa, and I wanted, but I want to go that. So that was, um, that was kind of the adventure I decided to, to get into. Um, you know, I, I just turned 50 years old this year, and I thought, you know what? It is time for me to reach that level of fluency in this, to just buckle down here. Um, so, as I've moved forward through that journey, I'm going to warn you, I'm not a happy PowerPoint user, so I'm going to refer to stuff up there, but the slides are not terribly glitzy, or, you know, I don't have any videos, and they don't do nifty effects or anything like that. It's more of an outline, so I'm actually going to try to hold your attention by talking, um, which may not have been the best choice given my current um, rather voice, voice situation. But, um, and since the talk is about living your language, the slides are all actually bilingual. Um, so I'm going to make a point to pronounce all of the Eloisa to you, largely because I just want to show you it can be done. You can actually not just create the languages, but you can use them and link them and share them with other people. That way. So, um, so Shlom is that. What do I mean by this? Um, and basically, I came up with uh, with four sort of thoughts about what this whole living your language thing was about. 
Um, the first one is um, lattice or fluency. And I came, as I was researching, preparing this talk, I came to realize that um, that's a pretty vague term when you come right down to it. Um, and I ended up defining it as the ability to say the things that you want to say without unusually long pauses for thought or other signs of distress. Of, of distress. Um, and uh, there's a, a great couple of quotes from uh, a guy by the name of Ben Faber, who does a, a blog and, and website and a whole project called Fluent in Three Months. And I'll put in a plug for that. That's the actual website is fluentinthreemonths.com. And, and he just makes this point of going from country to country to country and starting from absolute ground zero and in three months sort of working his way to a point where he can sit down, make friends, full conversations with people, and talk about all sorts of daily subjects. Um, and, and he was somewhat of an inspiration because um, he took a different view on fluency. Um, he said the silliest fluency test that some of challenge that someone ever gave him was, can you explain how interest rates influence inflation in your target language? <laughs> and he said, that's a silly test because I can't for the life of me do that in English. <clears throat> and I like to think I'm fluent. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I think we look at fluency and that's what we think is, oh, I should be able to explain how nuclear fission works or how to perform brain surgery. Um, and I think it's important to not sort of follow that sort of elitist level, if you will. But fluency is when you can do what you want to do in language, when you can talk about the stuff that you want to be able to talk about, you're fluent. Okay? And that means that you can't, you know, explain how to go into the library and use the Dewey Decimal System. Who cares? <laughs> you are inclined to do that. Um, so then the other parts of living your language that I decided um, were sort of involved in this. Um, one was uh, sedlansis, which is frequency. Um, and just basically meaning that I, I'm trying to find ways to fit the language into my daily life regularly and often, as much as I can, try to weave bits of it in. And obviously that doesn't include, you know, holding lots of conversations with people because you know, let's face it, the Alosa speaking community consists of one right now. Um, <clears throat> with, I, I've got two or three more people, Jim Hopkins, um, Thomas Lee, uh, and I think maybe one or two others who know bits and pieces and will occasionally send a sentence or two to me or whatever, but um, the, the, it's just not a big conversation right now. Um, so you have to find other ways to look at it. Um, another one, and this is something that actually Jen was going to emphasize a lot, uh, which the Alosa work for is thought and for viewpoint. And it basically means um, taking a viewpoint of someone who is a native speaker of your language, a native member of the culture that speaks that language, and living your life as though you're sort of an expat from there, living here. Surrounded by nobody who speaks your language, but knowing that your mind and your worldview is working that way. Um, which is, it's a bit of a mind bending experience sometimes to sort of think, okay, if I were um, a native inhabitant of Alorna, the, the planet where the you know, language is spoken, and I had somehow, you know, ended up here and was living in my life in this culture, how would I look at that? And, and, how would I then explain things like a cell phone? I mean, I might not normally have a word for cell phone or shampoo, you know, or, or something like that. So what sort of circumlocution do you come up with and, and how do you start wording these things? It, it's a fascinating mental exercise. Um, and then the final thought, that, and I'm still striving for this, I want you to know this is, this is one of my goals for this year. Um, I want to get that in a big way. Uh, and that is Sikahanai um, Otsalietna, may you dream in your language. Um, and that was a quote, um, there's a, on Facebook there's a group, uh, it's a, the Conlex 
group, not Caroline, but Carlos. Um, and I think it's called the, it's something like the Great Hall of Complexology or something like that. Um, it's a group that um, Inara Tabir uh, founded. And she coined the term as being a Caroline done with a specific purpose of being a fully working language in which its creator intends to achieve fluency. I haven't heard the word used elsewhere, but, um, but I did tell her that I, I did a poll in there of people who were interested in doing this stuff. And, uh, and I agreed that I would so we put in a plug for anyone who's interested in being fluent to kind of go look up that group and, and see what they're doing. Um, and I think to me, like, some, I think it was an honor myself who came out with the, the quote, maybe dream in your language, it's a, sort of a blessing for con miners. And I thought, um, that to me is kind of a sign. When you really internalize the language that much, when you're living it, you really start dreaming in it. And I know people who do that, um, Jim Hopkins being one of them. Um, and I've done it a couple of times, and it's like, I, I want to make, I want to do that. I'm going to get to the point where I know it that well, and I'm living it that well. Um, so that was that was what I did by living the language. And so then I have. Um, how can I imagine why I do this? Um, because I have to say, this isn't really for the faint of heart. Um, you know, diving in and saying, I'm going to become fluent in a language that I have created that absolutely nobody else speaks, for which no materials exist that I have not created. No, no <laughs> literature, no anything exists that I haven't done. Um, it's a lot of work. You know? um, <clears throat> and it's a lot of work where you also have to look at it and say, at the end of this, what do I have? You know, um, I mean, if you're learning, you know, pick any Natlan, I mean, Sanskrit, even, you know, if it's not spoken, at the end of it, you can say, well, but there's, there's great corpus of literature and everything that I that have access to. So, but obviously, as, as a Kalmanger, the great corpus of literature is the great corpus of literature that I personally have written. Um, so I thought, well, okay, how can I imagine? Why do this? And Dolan uh, uh came to me as the first reason, which was just personal satisfaction. Um, it is an accomplishment. And, and a rare one, as you know, we can all attest, there's not a ton of people who are really politically fluent, you know, can just do what I decided to do, just <coughs> coming out with spontaneous monologues. Um, and uh, Jim shared a bunch of stuff with me on that um, and about why he was doing that and why he got to that point. And he said that um, basically that if you want to be fluent in your language, you have to be in love with it. Um, and just be motivated by that deep personal investment. Um, and, and he compared it to learning in that language in the sense that uh, he says, if I'm learning, I'm traveling the national language just to prove a thesis or test a hypothesis. Um, I don't really have the motivation to learn, learn the language thoroughly to that really deep point where it, it's kind of living in my heart. Um, but if I am absolutely in love with the people and the culture expressed by that language, then I'm going to immerse myself in it every waking moment and never be able to get enough of it. And, and I think. That, it, that brings a reward. If you, if you love your family that much, if you really have, you know, you, you've got developed this deep personal sort of connection to it, and it is a language of your soul, um, then the more you learn of it, it, it is a personal satisfaction, it's a self-fulfillment. Um, and as an aside to that, I also have Lovelania um, Akulansis, uh, personal enrichment. Um, it's a kind of a Sapper Whorf reason, and I know Sapper Whorf has all sorts of debates and arguments that one can get into on that. But just that ability to see the world through different eyes that I mentioned. Um, I mean, that also is, uh, it is a why you would do this. It, it opens new horizons in many ways as you, you start thinking of the world in your language. You suddenly realize that there are terms in your language that have to do with these. 
Um, but of course, I probably won't be able to spontaneously think of right now as I want to. But where there's where there, there will be a word in a lursa that I will use, and I will come to realize that I have no good way to explain that in English. I need the term for what I'm thinking of, but but I don't just there is no single English word or even you know anything short of uh, two sentences that I can really explain that with. And I find that that's it's very expanding when you start really start getting to that point and realizing that I can think of things easily that maybe I couldn't have thought of quite so easily if I wasn't doing this. Um, and then uh, Jim also commented on that sort of thing that um, if your kind line is aesthetically pleasing to you, then even just using language is its own reward. Um, there is, of course, as I have up here, um, Oroban Sabiacius, uh, the depth of story writing. And I think um, Sally was sharing something on this earlier. Uh, and actually, over the conversation we were having uh, before, that um, there, as you're writing stories, uh, I think we, we determined that, you know, yeah, you can just sort of use the, sort of the, the Jonathan Swift method to just sort of kick in a made up word here or there. But if you have that depth, if you have that sort of Tolkien depth behind it, um, the story writing becomes a lot richer because now you, you have a better feel for the culture and the, the mindset of the people that are doing it. Um, the next one is one that, that I would admit I use, Tashinensis, uh, spirituality. Um, and this is something that's occasionally come up on the list and, and some other places. Um, I find Amarsa to be a very spiritual experience. Um, I, you know, if I pray or if I'm doing any sort of, you know, worship type activity, I, I have found that it's reached the point where that comes to me in Amarsa and it actually doesn't feel connected unless I'm doing it now. Um, and I don't know if that's just very weird or, you know, whatever, but at the same time, it, it is also very enriching and very fulfilling um, to reach that point. And it, I don't know, it somehow adds a personal aspect or a spiritual connectivity to you know, the universe, whatever, whatever you happen to be um, involved in at the time, to have that, that sort of personal language thing going on. Um, and then the last one for a why um, is just um, the Japas or bragging rights. Um, and, you know, it, it is a reason. Um, I don't personally feel it can be the only reason. But if you have any sort of, uh, if you are motivated by the, the ability to tell others about your achievements, achieving fluency in your language is something to brag about, at least with fellow commentators. And, and actually, I've found, uh, even outside of that, um, you know, it, it does. Uh, I, I've been in the last several years, maybe the last even ten or twelve years, I've been very open about my commenting activities with my coworkers, which um, and and they thankfully I work for a uh, a very uh, really very liberal and open-minded community college in a very liberal and open-minded state, and therefore. Um, Everybody just thinks it's cool when you tell them that. Not that any of them all want to run out and become conliners, but but I have received no negative feedback from coworkers about doing this. Um, and so there is a certain, you know, that there's a coolness factor there. But they just think it's neat that I can, you know, take notes in or whatever. And so if you're gonna do this though, we have certain um shavana or prerequisites. Excuse me. Um, and the first one I put down, these are going to seem a little odd and and I, may, and I don't want them to be discouraging to anybody. Uh, preface this. Um, the first one I have there, Asa Shahaliya, um, or completeness of the language. Um, if your language is just a very basic grammar outline, and maybe a few dozen words, um, you're probably not ready to do this. 
Okay, it, it may need a little more work than that because it's, it's sort of tough to live in that. Um, you can need a language that has at least a little bit of cap to it, or you know, a little built up. Um, I would, personally, I would think that play on would probably be kind of tough to do that because there are some sort of blatant holes in there that you kind of you'd be filling in as you were as you were working on this. Um, Tariata, my other language that they had mentioned. Um, I, I don't believe I could do this to this extent now in Tariata because Tariata really only has I don't know about 900 words, something like that. I mean, it's got a decently filled out grammar, but it's not. You know, I haven't really recorded it down. Or, so it's like you know, I don't know that I could really say yeah, I could <coughs> live my language using that one. Um, but at the same time, many of the techniques that I have used to gain fluency in Alorsa and Jim Hopkins has used to gain fluency in Ipani, and actually that I heard Jim Henry talk about, I'm so excited to hear you say all that, about answer that question about how you gain fluency um, in um, Desert Moon. Um, because they were so much the same that I and Jim Hopkins have been using. Um, Many of those techniques, you can take a less complete language, like, you know, like I was saying, like a, like a tie out there, or even something that really it had is sort of very startup. You can use those techniques uh, to build that language out in, in very good ways to reach a point before too long where you can start doing this. Um, so this really is something that everyone could use. Um, so then I have uh, Sahin and Nemo, um, or Enough Words, uh, which is another one of those vague moving targets. Um, you know, how many words is enough? Well, how many words do you need? Um, you know, basically, and the other thing that I found is you can have a lot of words, um, but if they're not words that you use every day, um, then there's a lot of words, you know, you may, you may need a lot of other words. Um, there was a uh, an interesting example that somebody gave me on this at one point. Um, with, I believe it was um, with uh, Golden Vulcan, I think it was, and uh, which has an extremely rich scientific and logical discourse vocabulary, which makes perfect sense for a language intended to be used in that sort of Vulcan context. It was, however, lacking some sort of basic words, and I have to get what they were, but they might have been words like, I don't know, chair or something like that. Um, but, and I, I think everyone probably knows the feeling of that, when you suddenly realize you've been working in this language for four years, and that you forgot to improve the work the table. Um, you know, <clears throat> but, so there are, certain, there are certain words that if you're gonna actually live this and use it in your daily life and in general, that you will find yourself creating as you're trying to write the journal, right? there's nothing like journal to build up your vocabulary. As you suddenly realize all these things in your life that you never thought of talking about. Um, the next uh, prerequisite, this is one that, that Jim Hopkins shared with me, and I think he's right on target, um, is the polaris, or stability, or unchangingness. Um, or he uses the term, um, see if I can pronounce this correctly, um, Kojin Son Saos, or gatekeeping. And uh, one, one of the things that's very easy to do as call writers, and, and I can remember doing this a lot when I was much younger, is you start a language and you sort of start rolling through it and you get, you know, a few weeks into it and you suddenly realize that about 30% of what you've done, is like, oh, that's terrible, I hate that. I'm gonna totally trash all of this stuff and go this totally other different direction. And then you go another about six or eight weeks and you say, now about 40% of that is just that, that's trash. I don't want any of that stuff in there. So let me throw all of that out and go this other direction. Um, and you're doing, and simultaneously doing the same thing with vocabulary and you kind of pull in a lot of Latin roots and then say, nah, I want this to look like that. I want it to have this sound system. So I'm gonna pull in a whole bunch of roots suddenly from, um, you know, Swahili. Uh, or something like that, or, or I'm going to just make up all these totally good roots, and, and I'm going to throw out all these other roots that I have. And the problem with that is, it, it's not, if the language is continually in flux, it is very difficult to actually learn it. 
because it's changing faster than you can keep up with it. Um, so the, the principle that, that Jim gave me was uh, that it should be hard. Once you reach a point where you've kind of got a, a language that you're ready to start doing this with, it should be hard to th get things into the language and hard to get them out. So in other words, some new concept, some new thing occurs to you, and you kind of put it down on, on a work table in your mind, so to speak, and you let it gel for a while and say, is that real? Should that really be in there? How do I feel about that? Does it feel like it will work with the language? I know that sounds very weird, but that really is how, at least I do, a lot of development in the world, and how I've done it for, you know, 37 years, is just, you take the item and you look at it, and if it doesn't feel right, even if it's the coolest thing, you say, I wish my language had that. If it doesn't feel right, it's like, I'm not gonna let it in until I'm sure it's supposed to be there, because once I put it in, it ain't gonna leave. I mean, you know, without, it's gonna have to like be chiseled out of the rock before I'll let it out. Um, and what that does, that produces a very stable language that is a lot easier to learn because you're not trying to keep up with, you know, an ever-changing uh, fluid landscape you're trying to get onto. Um, and then a shameless or usability. Um, and by that, I basically mean a language that you will use. Uh, that the sound and feel of it is pleasing to you. It doesn't have to be pleasing to anybody else. And I want to say that's been a very hard one for me. I, I have a problem personally where I tend to sort of um, think about, okay, what will, what will everyone else think of this? And I say, are other people going to think this is okay? Anyone else have that problem? Yeah. <laughs> you all know what I mean. And so, I, you know, I have to keep reminding myself this is not an artistic work that I am doing because I want everybody else to give me their opinion on how wonderful it is. This is an artistic work I want to do because I want it to be a reflection of what I want. I, I want it, I want to like it. I want it to be something pleasing to me that will express things in a way I find meaningful and powerful. Um, and so I think that level of usability, and that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, even we talked a lot about it wheel and how, um, you know, John and, and how, you know, you feel like, well, it's, it would be extremely difficult to use. At the same time, um, I get the very strong sense it's very pleasing to you the way it is, that you like it the way it is. It, it scratches the, the itch that I have, yes. Exactly, it scratches the itch that you have. And, and I think that's an important thing, and if, if your language does that for you, then you are right on target for this, because you, you will use it because it, it works for you. Um, and the last prerequisite that I get here is um, catharsis or self-investment. Because as I said, it's not really for the of heart, it's going to be an investment of your time and your energy and your soul. Pour yourself into this language enough and, and believe in it enough, if you want to think of it that way, to invest that kind of time and energy to learn it. It's, it's not, you know, it, it's not kind of a, you know, 20 minutes every couple of weeks sort of thing. I mean, you really end up diving into this thing. Um, so then I have um, katenar, or challenges. Um, and the first one, uh, I, you'll notice that these all begin with, with the same word there, which in Alosa is blindness, or lack. Um, and I think those are, a lot of, in a lot of ways, our biggest challenges with learning our kind lines. Um, in many ways, there are no different, if you suddenly decided, I'm going to learn Western Abenaki, um, you would run into similar challenges, not quite as much. But Western Albanaki, which is the Native American language spoken in Vermont and Southern Quebec, uh, is not, shall we say, extensively documented. There's not a huge body of speakers at this point, and there's not an awful lot of written literature in it or about it. And so there's a lot of challenge to learning a language like that. And in, in many ways, it's the one that we face. Um, so we have um, on this anjan sadhana, or lack of learning materials, because there aren't any unless you make them. Um, 
which is something I've been reminded of. But as I said, I've got a couple of other people who, my, who are friends of mine who are kind of interested in learning, and they bug me to produce these learning materials, which is a task I find kind of concerning and a bit intimidating, figuring out how I can produce something that would let other people learn this. Um, but it's only pro that's only a problem if you see the only way of learning the language as being through tightly scripted materials and methods, which of course is not the case. Um, and then of course we have um, Landis Versicaliona, um, or lack of people to practice with, lack of, lack of with practicers. Literally. Um, I, I had somebody tell me the other day, which I think is totally wrong, um, that it is not possible to really learn a language that nobody else speaks. Um, I disputed that uh, by pointing out that people who learn distinct languages, uh, such as you know, Sumerian or Egyptian or something like that, um, I'm not exactly finding a lot of you know, speakers to practice you know, Middle Egyptian with them. I mean, it's just not, you know, or, or Sumerian or whatever. Um, is it harder to do that way? Yes, it, it certainly is. If there's nobody else around you that can speak the language, yeah, it's harder than you know, learning Spanish or something where you may find you know, dozens or thousands of people practice it. But it's definitely not impossible. Um, the next two are challenges that are a little more personal for me. Um, we have Juan's uh, Bora, Eshodia, uh, Aranisa. Uh, lack of time, motivation, and focus. Um, which are really tough ones for me. I have, a, I have a pretty busy job and a pretty busy life. I am a uh, learning system administrator and assistant chief technology officer. I you know, work in a relatively comparatively small IT department, almost you know, one of the larger ones in our college system. But you know, there's a ton of stuff to do there, and I've got a very busy life. I've got you know, four kids, I've got five grandkids, um, you know, I mean, I have a lot of interests, or I have ADD, um, and it's often hard for me to determine which of those is <laughs> um, But you can still do this, and I, and I remind myself on this, you can accomplish a lot working on, uh, by le on learning a language by working on it lots of little bits of time instead of big chunks of time. Um, and that sometimes it's a hard one for me to remember because it doesn't feel as productive as each little session that you don't feel like you did a lot. But if you, you know, just sort of work it in, um, you know, when you're, you're sitting in a waiting room, if you've got a way to, to sort of practice something where you have a notebook and you can just scribble notes or anything like that, any, every chance that you can get to use it is an opportunity to practice and learn more and so on. And lots of little bits of those really add up over time. Um, and the last challenge that I give here, um, Landis Behrensasa, a lack of self-confidence. And again, this is a personal one, um, and probably my toughest, um, because I, I just tend to be that way. And, and the other people, am I the only one in the room that has self-confidence issues on these sorts of things? <laughs> no. no, no, no. Um, because I'm always asking myself, what can I really do this? And is this a good use of my time? You know, what are, what are other people going to think of me investing this amount of time learning my own language that nobody else speaks? Um, am I too lazy or undisciplined or disorganized? Do I really have that kind of language ability or am I just fooling myself? Um, and the way I overcome this is literally just one little goal at a time. You just, you know, you never really overcome it in a big sense per se, but you just, like, just like the using little bits of language time, you just keep going one little bit at a time. I'm going to keep my journal in this, I'm going to do a presentation in it, I am going to make this video recording tonight, or this audio recording tonight, or I'm going to translate this very short story out of the Reader's Digest tonight, whatever. Um, and, you know, it really does work. Um, I know that sounds a little cliche, but... Yeah. So, um, so on the assumption that I've actually convinced you this is a cool thing to do now, or Zakaresh asked more, not
what next? Okay, then I am there. Now what? So how do you even start this? Um, and I have uh, the first item seemed to be he found that Zalika and um, Alainika start with a good attitude. Find the easy bits first and learn to write or say something. Don't worry about being perfect on grammar or pronunciation. Begin somewhere, but actually begin. And that works too if, you're, if you have a pound line that maybe isn't, like I mentioned before, you know, it only has you know, a few dozen words, a few hundred words, whatever. Um, you can still start, just begin somewhere. You know, just decide, I am going to write a sentence in this language every single day. Or, you know, and as it gets a little bigger, it's like, I am going to write a paragraph. I'm going to keep a little tiny journal, and every single day, I am going to write a paragraph in this language about what happened to me today. But begin somewhere. That, that, it's, it's like that proverb about the, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step, or something to that general tone. Um, and you can just start with that, which are zanya adrensa yakun, small specific goals. Because big, massive, broad goals are really hard to achieve. Um, and lots, whereas lots of little specific goals are not quite so bad. Um, setting a goal like, I want to have a good command of general vocabulary is almost impossible to hit. Because, what does that even mean? But, if you set a goal of, I am going to learn the words for all the primary objects in the kitchen, by 5 p.m. tomorrow night. <laughs> you can do that. And then you've got a list of them. And then you can you know, kind of run over that a few times. And before you know it, you, can, you could walk around your kitchen and refer to everything in your kitchen in your life. Um, and it's a goal. And, and each one of those that you achieve is also going to give you that little burst of motivation and satisfaction and like, hey, I could do that. Look at that. I know the words for all these things. And then you said another one, you know, say, okay, in two days I'm going to know how to do these things, or I'm going to, you know, know all parts, you know, the parts of the body, arms, and legs, and everything. Or I'm going to know how to, you know, tell my cat I'm giving it its food now, or something like that. Each one of those that you do is going to push the fluency and to push your vocabulary if you don't know, have. You know, if you're missing words for things like, you know, dish and cat and things like that, you're going to get all of these. And if you keep setting those small, specific goals, <coughs> it will grow the language. It will also grow your fluency in the language. Um, then we have um, basana, or deadlines. Um, and there's a great quote that I saw here. Um, this is uh, another quote from Ben Faber. Uh, who said, uh, a goal is a dream with a deadline. And, and I like that. I, you know, um, someday really doesn't exist. It always is just some blurry point of distance. But if you go for specific achievable goals in specific time frames, they add up. Each goal may look inconsequential, and each timeline may be short, but when you add them up, they will help you achieve that goal. So, you know, again, you may even make a goal like, every day I am going to write a paragraph in my journal, in my language. And every one of those paragraphs for the first month may look to you like, that was a really pretty lame, small paragraph. I didn't really say much. But by the end of the month, you can probably bang those up because you've been doing them all month long. They may not have taken you very long, each one of them, but as you went through them, you got it. I mean, you were building your command, building your command of the language, and probably building up the language as you're doing that. I don't know about everyone else, but I have found, you know, you start writing about your day and you invariably find some word that you cannot believe you didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, <clears throat> and the last one, Eshvel uh, Jehalesach, which literally is actually uh, away from the safe haven, away from the safe place, or get out of your comfort zone. 
Um, my getting out of the comfort zone for me, at least, and I don't know if this is true for the rest of you, but it was talk out loud. Um, you know, actually open your mouth and let sounds in your language come out of your mouth and use them. Um, that, that, for whatever reason, that was a huge, that's a huge hurdle for me to sort of get past that. And I don't know if that would be true for everyone else, but I'm sure that everyone has something like that where there's this sort of thing where I'm on my comfort zone is here and I need to move over there and whether that's um, I need to make a video. Um, Benny Faber does the, this great thing where he'll you know, sort of show off how far he's gotten the language by taking a webcam and just doing a virtual tour of the apartment he's in <laughs> and explaining all the different things in that language. And uh, I mean, that would, that would be a move, that would be moving out of my comfort zone to kind of do that sort of spontaneous thing, no script, just take a video camera and do that and then post it for all the world to see. Um, but those are the kind of things you have to do, you know. I mean, you can start by just doing things like pointing at the table and, you know, saying your language's word for it. Um, you know, none of it, basically none of this learning fluency is going to work unless you actually use the language. And that, that's really the big one, is you've got to kind of get out of the comfort zone and keep going. Um, you know, talk to your cat or dog, the cat will ignore you, the dog won't care what you're saying as long as you pay attention anyway. <laughs> so, you know, whatever it takes. Um, and the other one that I have is write, you know, whatever it is, stories, essays, par a paragraph, even if you feel like it'll break, make your brain melt, but just, you know, get, get using it. We're out of the comfort zone and just actually start doing something. And about two minutes of truth, so I'm probably leave some time for questions too. Right? I will kind of blast through these last couple of here quickly. Um, so I'm going to just kind of skip through this one pretty quick. Um, you know, basically, the languages consist of words or you know, semantic meaning units, whatever they are in your language. Um, and so there's a lot of just remembering those. Um, basically, acquiring the language for it is pretty important to the process, but often for us commoners, identifying that language for it can be a real challenge. Um, and, and certainly one way to do that is, you know, the journal and just starting to, you know, make lists of the words you, that you use in your real life. I've actually done things like sit there in the, um, in the bedroom and just go around and make in English, a list of all the things that I see. And then, um, actually, I brought this up with me, but, um, oh yes, I did. I, I started, I have to show this up. So I started doing that on uh, three of my five cards. And I just made a list. It's a little three column list, written very, very small, um, of everything that I saw in the bedroom. And then I turned it over, and I made that list, that same list, in the Morsa. And then I spent some time and I would, you know, read the English and sort of work my way through and give the English a call the way. You know, just kept doing that. Any tool like that that, that helps you get a list. Um, and if you're having a problem finding lists like that, I recommend that there's some great books out there like this. Has anyone seen this? This is Baron's French vocabulary, and they make it in about eight languages. And it is this great little cat um, categorized list of terms. Um, you know, and I mean, restaurant terms and kitchen terms and mathematical terms and scientific terms and vegetables and everything else. And so if you're, if you're at a loss where to even begin, um, you know, I grieve what the world words that I need. Even just looking at one of these can start to give you some ideas. Um, there are a bunch of other lists out there, you know, emotions and, I mean, there's just a million of places like that. You can start and just sort of get some ideas on words that you might use. Um, I'm trying to, to advocate for studying the words in your own life because, you know, and just making those lists like that because those are the words you're going to use all the time. You know, you start, start paying attention to the words that you use and those are the ones that you're going to 
that, that you're going to need. Those are the ones you're going to start using in your journal, using as you're talking to yourself in the shower or, or you know, presumably you reach the point of doing it in your own language. Those, the words that you use every day are the ones that occur in your dreams. Um, so, um, and then there are a number of tools to help you out there with, with those that are the old fashioned flashcards. There's uh, tools like Any Memo, which I love. It's a, it's a product for Android that you can make up your own flashcard lists with and study them. Um, and another good place to get a list of words, if you've ever seen those first thousand words in books, they're really great because they've got pictures. Um, and then Barron's makes a, a picture dictionary series that's similar. And you can start looking at those and you know, giving words for your language, picking out the words that are meaningful to you. And then, skipping to the last bit here, um, Akshal and Tolsa, use them constantly. I really can't stress enough. You know, the tools, the lists, all of that is useful, but the only thing that's going to make you comfortable with the language is using it a lot and often, and whenever you can find a way to make it uh, work in your life. Um, this um, I'm just going to gloss this one. These are some ideas that I had that I used. Um, most of them make sense. You know, you've seen me taking notes. I do my shopping lists in Alyssa, uh, which is great. It, 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 it's wonderful practice. You do your shopping list. You can even do it in English first. And then you just translate the whole thing to Alyssa. And the only one you bring you to the store is the Alyssa version, the, the version in your language. And it is a great way to learn those words. It's a bunch of the story, you know, you can't get all the stuff. And now you can remember what it all is. Um, and then, um, you know, translation and writing, making sounds and videos. Um, basically, just use the language in ways that make it natural. Um, I'm going to put in a plug for the, the morning pages, one at the top. Um, if anyone's read a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, um, she advocates this, and she's actually talking about creative process and freeing everyone to, to write stories and such. Um, and she advocates, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you sit down and write three pages longhand, stream of consciousness. Whatever comes out of your, you know, whatever makes it from your brain to your hand, just put it down on the paper, just to kind of get you into that writing mode. Um, and I'm going to give an adaptation of that for online use, that wake up in the morning and just do kind of a stream of consciousness, but do it in your language as much as you can. Um, I would say three pages in a lesson, three pages in English would probably take me 45 minutes. Three pages in a lesson would probably take me 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so I kind of went for one page because I'm not a morning person, so I don't usually have that kind of time to get dedicated at that point. So I would just sort of like pick out one little page. Feel yeah, like I had a count or something, but just that thing of getting your mind started with it, um, I think is a really good thing to do. So, last slide, and hopefully we'll have time for this kind of questions. Um, so, how did this work for me in Orsa? And uh, I thought I would just give you an example of that and say something in Orsa to, to kind of show you where I reached. Um, and I'm not going to read the prepared one because I tried practicing that and it just never came out right. So, a premise to the Zenyash, you're more than a lion, you know, you're more than a lion, it's so kill or yada, the kill John, the magic behind it. And there is my yala el mo, el abral, the yada session. So oh, three months ago, uh, more or less what I just said, three months ago, I couldn't have done this. I couldn't have stood up before you and just spoken like this in the language, done a presentation like this in the language. But now you can see that I can do it. And uh, the key was just doing it. Just, you know, getting out of my comfort zone and actually making my mouth work. Um, I learned some things, like I learned that focus and diligence are my strong points. So I had to, I get bored pretty quickly. And so I had to kind of, um, you know, do shorter bursts, do those short, short bits that I was telling about and weave it in in little places. <laughs> Done a lot of journals and notes and shopping lists. Um, I've become a believer in the whole flashcard thing. 
which I hadn't. I started using just the actual flashcards, and then I found it. I did one. I spent a lot of time making it up, and I lost it, and decided that maybe the electronic versions were probably better. Um, the, the absolute biggest one for me has been talking out loud. Um, what I finally did to get myself started on that, to cast the block, was I, I sort of went downstairs with a computer that had Audacity on it, which is the, the recording program. Um, and I just started reading those morning pages that I wrote, or elements out of my journal, and I made a point. I, I just determined I am not going to practice it first. I am going to just sit here, I'm going to open it to the page, I'm going to hit the record button, and I'm going to read it at whatever speed I do, and just do a whole bunch of these until I get to the point where I can where I've improved enough to be able to do that. And it made the difference. It really did. Um, and then just quickly the, you know, I haven't really been so good at sharing lines with others. Um, you know, but I think actually this, this fits into that category, so you know, using it more in those ways. And uh, the last one I, I thought was kind of funny, surrounded by the uninterested. Um, it's just a reality that the vast majority of people in our lives may think that what we do is interesting and neat and have no desire to hear us give a monologue and, uh, and, and, and you know. But um, that's just not really why we do this. Is it, it really is it really is kind of a, a personal sort of thing, it's personal for So um, with that, hopefully I've motivated you to think that you too can become fluent. It's, it's not magic. Um, and so uh, I've given you some contact info. My, that's the Universal website, which is uh, painfully in the locking as I um, and then there's contact information, how to get hold of me um, if you have any questions beyond this. And uh, that's it now. Is there any questions before? Thank you. Thank you. So we might have time for one question. Sorry about that. Okay, this is something that I've been wondering about as I look at all the people doing their languages. Do you feel that a writing system is really kind of essential? I think it depends on on the culture that you've got. Um, I do have a third language that I've used in the U.S. Uh, called Kukal. And uh, that language actually doesn't have a writing system because the people that I envision speaking it just don't write. I mean, they're, they're, they're non written culture entirely. So I just write it in, in a romanization and I don't worry about it. Um, I don't think it's a critical piece. I think you can do perfectly well using the Roman alphabet if that feels right to you. Um, it didn't for me, and actually, Alosa is complex enough that it desperately needed. <laughs> Something other than a romanization, as, as anyone who's seen the, the romanization can attest, the romanization is a little nasty. Um, I, I do want to point out, though, so the font that I have here is one that the Britain Watkins made for me. And uh, in his defense, I want to point out that that kerning issue there between the first two letters on the third, uh, on the second bullet there, um, those really are right next to each other. and. If I were doing this on a Mac, they would look right next to each other. <laughs> and we have been fighting this stupid printing issue for a while and cannot figure out why it is that the Mac is the only one that will display it perfectly. <laughs> um, it is not a problem in the font, as far as we can tell, it's in the font rendering engine on both Linux and Windows. So that, that is not, you know, fair to him, that is not a problem in this font. Okay. Do we have any more time? Or do I really do that a lot? Are there any more questions? I, I, I would not. If there are more questions, we are going right into a break so you can see Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for your